the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Good evening. Uh, it's great to see you all here, and uh, it's a wonderful thing for the Foundation to be having its 25th annual Evening for Peace. And actually, there's one other person in the room, at least one other person in the room, who's been to all 25 of these dinners, and that's my wife, Carol Lee. <laughs> and my great support. Uh, we, we are gathering uh, at a time of renewed hope for peace, and we're honoring two outstanding individuals tonight, Reverend George Regas and Stanley Scheinbaum, who have together, probably, often behind the scenes, uh, dedicated more than a century to works of peace, and justice. This evening will shine a light on their acts of peace and world citizenship, and it's our hope that their lives will inspire all of us, and particularly the young people who are here with us tonight. We hope it will inspire them to lives of greater courage, compassion, and commitment. Renewed hope is necessary, but it is not sufficient. We still live in a world in which conflicts are too often settled by force rather than law, in which we spend far too much of our precious resources, uh, human and economic, on war and its preparations. Right now, the world's nations are spending approximately $1.3 trillion annually on military preparations and war, with the United States spending nearly half of that amount. Since the beginning of the nuclear age, as you saw earlier in the little tape that was played, the United States alone has spent $7.5 trillion on nuclear weapons and their delivery systems, and we're spill, still, at this point in time, spending more than $50 billion annually on nuclear weapons. We need change in our world, and I dare say, change is coming. One thing that is absolutely certain is that nuclear weapons do not and cannot provide protection to their possessors. They, they can be used to commit monstrous acts of mass murder by a first strike or in retaliation for a preceding attack, but they cannot protect their possessors. The only way we can be sure that we are safe uh, from a nuclear attack is by abolishing these weapons. This is what President-elect Obama has said, and I'm going to quote him now. A world without nuclear weapons is profoundly in America's interest and the world's interest. It is our responsibility to make the commitment and do the hard work to make this vision a reality, unquote. That's the vision of our new president, a very different vision than we've been seeing over the last many, many years. Uh, 
it is a time of renewed hope. When he says our responsibility to make the commitment, I think he means all of us. I think that Barack Obama and America need this commitment from all of us and from each of us. But it, it is up to him and to all of us to fulfill this commitment by our actions. At the foundation, we have developed a nuclear disarmament agenda for, the, <clears throat> for President Obama during his first 100 days in office. We ask that he take three steps. It's up on the screen, but I, I think the print may be too small. First, we ask him to make a public commitment for U.S. leadership for a world free of nuclear weapons and to do this in a major foreign policy address. Second, we ask him to open bilateral negotiations with the Russians on a range of nuclear policy issues, from taking these weapons off high alert status, to no first use, to dramatically reducing the numbers. We need Russia as a partner on this journey to sanity. Third, we ask him to initiate global action to convene a meeting of all nine nuclear weapon states in order to negotiate a treaty for the phased, verifiable, irreversible, and transparent elimination of all nuclear weapons by the year 2020. This can be done. The main thing, the main point I'd like to leave you with is that a world free of nuclear weapons is not an impossible dream. The genie, in fact, can be put back in the bottle. The process may begin with a dream, but it continues with the politics of peace and justice. It also, if, if at the same time, it also increases our security, as it surely will. We are far the better for it. Now, we've asked President Obama to do three things. I'd like to ask each of you also to do three things. First, uh, you'll, you'll get a packet, if you wish, if you wish to take it, there will be packets that will be handed out at the end of the evening as you leave the room. And I hope you'll take it. And, and in those packets will be the, the items that you can take the action on. First, uh, I, we ask you to look at this 100-day agenda. And if you agree with it, send it to President-elect Obama with a personal note of encouragement from yourself telling him why you would like to see a world with zero nuclear weapons. Second, sign the Foundation's appeal to the next president for U.S. leadership for a nuclear weapons free world. And then gather another 15 or 50 or 500 signatures and send them back to the Foundation by early January so that we'll, we can gather them and present them shortly after the inauguration to the new president. And third, uh, you'll get a copy of the DVD that you saw tonight, actually a slightly longer version, slightly fuller version. It's 20 minutes instead of nine. And uh, we ask you to uh, arrange a showing of this DVD to a group uh, that you organize or that you belong to. So let me conclude with some thoughts by General Lee Butler. Lee, uh, Lee Butler was the former commander in chief of the United States Strategic Command who when he left the command decided that he was for the abolition of nuclear weapons and has worked for that ever since. He's also one of our past awardees. Um, Lee Butler speaking about nuclear weapons said this, we cannot at once keep sacred the miracle of existence and hold sacrosanct the capacity to destroy it. 
it is time to reassert the primacy of individual conscience, the voice of reason, and the rightful interests of humanity. I believe that the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation and each of you have an important role to play in our transformation to a peaceful and nuclear weapons free world. Your hope, commitment, involvement and support are making and will continue to make all the difference. We thank you for being here and we thank you so much for caring about these incredibly important issues. Thank you. In the enormity of a universe filled with billions of galaxies, there is only one place we know of that supports life. Every great human endeavor has happened on this single, precious, life-sustaining planet. This presentation on nuclear weapons and the human future sets forth the Foundation's case against nuclear weapons. The nuclear age was initiated only six decades ago. Humans created technology powerful enough to destroy our species and most life on Earth. Never before has humanity faced such a dire existential threat of its own making. Albert Einstein was the greatest scientist of the 20th century. His theories predicted the powerful amount of energy contained within the atom. After the atomic bombs were dropped, he warned, the splitting of the atom has changed everything, save our modes of thinking, and thus we drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. To avoid the catastrophe that Einstein foresaw, we must shift our thinking from reliance on military force to reliance on cooperation and diplomacy. To outline our case against nuclear weapons, they are catastrophically dangerous, incompatible with global security, enormously costly, illegal under international law, and immoral. Nuclear weapons are catastrophically dangerous they threaten all inhabitants of Earth. One nuclear weapon can destroy a city. A few nuclear weapons can destroy a country. Even a small nuclear exchange could threaten civilization. In today's world, there are about 26,000 nuclear warheads. 12,000 of these are operationally deployed and 3,500 are thought to be on hair trigger alert, ready to be fired within minutes of an order to do so. Currently, nine countries have nuclear weapons. Russia, the United States, France, Israel, the United Kingdom, China, Pakistan, India, and most recently, North Korea. More than 95% of all nuclear weapons are in the arsenals of the United States and Russia. War is not waged just by nation states. In today's world, we cannot rule out the possibility of nuclear terrorism. If even a small and crudely constructed nuclear bomb were to be used in a major city like New York, the death toll could exceed one million. According to Graham Allison of Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, a detonation in Manhattan could kill everyone within a half mile radius of Times Square. Even more would die from collapsing buildings, fire, and fallout. Allison estimates that the chances of a terrorist nuclear attack in the next decade are greater than 50%. Nuclear weapons are incompatible with global security. Despite the obvious catastrophic danger of nuclear weapons, 
Their deployment has been justified by a belief in nuclear deterrence, the prevention of attack by the threat of overwhelming retaliation. Deterrence is only a theory. If it was intended to make the world safer, it has failed. In fact, it has led to nuclear arms races and nuclear proliferation, making the world a more dangerous place. Deterrence can fail when an enemy, such as Osama bin Laden, cannot be located. In such a situation, the threat of retaliation is not credible. Since the beginning of the nuclear age, these weapons and their delivery systems have cost the United States more than seven and a half trillion dollars. In 2006, the United States spent about 54 billion dollars on nuclear weapons and their delivery systems, far higher than during the Cold War. Nuclear weapons are illegal under international law. Nuclear weapons destroy indiscriminately soldiers and civilians, men, women, and children, the aged and the newly born, the healthy and the infirm. Weapons that kill indiscriminately cause unnecessary suffering or are disproportionate to a preceding attack are illegal under international humanitarian law, the law of warfare. Nuclear weapons are immoral. They are immoral for the same reasons they are illegal. They kill indiscriminately and cause unnecessary suffering through the short and long-term effects of radiation. Humanity has a choice. We can continue with business as usual, or we can eliminate nuclear weapons before they eliminate us. Achieving change requires vision, leadership, and public pressure. To eliminate nuclear weapons, you must first have a vision of a world free of nuclear weapons. The Dalai Lama has stated, in the event of a nuclear war, there will be no victors because there will be no survivors. Is it not logical that we should remove the cause for our own destruction when we know the cause and have both the time and means to do so? We are calling upon you to help make this campaign a success by taking three steps. First, join with others who care about peace and nuclear disarmament. Visit our website at wagingpeace.org where you can find out more about our national campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. There you can sign the appeal to the next president. You can also sign up to receive our monthly e-newsletter, The Sunflower, and join the Foundation's Turn the Tide campaign to receive regular updates on legislation and opportunities to contact your congressional representatives. Second, make your voice heard. Sign the appeal to the next president. Question candidates about their policies on nuclear weapons and peace and help educate them on the issues. Lastly, vote your conscience. Third, share the message. Help spread the appeal to the next president. Get your friends, family, and coworkers to sign the appeal online or print hard copies from our website. Show this DVD to a friend or neighbor. Additionally, organize a showing or contact the foundation to arrange a presentation to your group or organization. If you are a student, be a leader for peace. Join the Foundation's Think Outside the Bomb network at thinkoutsidethebomb.org. Enter our International Nuclear Disarmament Video Contest featuring creative videos from around the world, exposure of your work on our website, and great prizes. Bring nuclear issues to your campus through an existing group or start a new one and investigate links to militarism and nuclearism on your campus. 
We invite you to join our committed team by becoming an active participant in our campaign for U.S. leadership for a nuclear weapons free world. To learn more about nuclear weapons issues, please visit our award winning websites, wagingpeace.org and nuclearfiles.org. Thank you very much. You, uh, you honor yourselves by honoring these two gentlemen tonight, may I say. Uh, George Regas is a dear friend and uh, a man I admire greatly. And my job tonight, or part of my job tonight, is to uh, honor uh, another dear and great friend, uh, Stanley Scheinbaum. <laughs> It, uh, I, I, wrote, I wrote some things down here because, uh, yeah. um, uh, George, of course, is an extraordinary uh, spiritual leader. Uh, Stanley is um, a, a leader. I, uh, you know, being asked, it's really silly, but being asked to, uh, in a limited number of minutes, uh, speak to this extraordinary man is like being uh, someone from Lilliput being asked to describe Gulliver. Um, I, I have known and loved and followed Stanley Scheinbaum for 35 years. I met him uh, at the event that he uh, put together that saved Daniel Ellsberg's life, effectively. And, and I'm, I'm honored to be able to say that, and I'm just even more honored to be able to say that, that, that Stanley has known me for about the last two years. <laughs> At least acknowledges knowing me <laughs> and, and now. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been an extraordinary uh, time that I have been following this man and watching him and learning from him. Um, he is, uh, he is, Someone that's the 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 kind of life that he has led has been hard to uh, understand. You you did an extraordinary job here when you described uh, the uh, him talking about his work with kings and princes and presidents and the work he has done in terms of uh, bringing uh, us toward peace in the Middle East. The the work he has done throughout the world. Um, this is a man who fears nothing, who is willing to go anywhere in the world to raise the banner of peace and do what he can to put himself on the line. He fears nothing and no one with the possible exception of his wife, Betty. <laughs> the two of them have had in their homes a, a virtual salon of, um, of world issues and the leaders of the world who have come uh, to them uh, and been honored in doing so because they have allowed us, those of us who care, to uh, struggle uh, with the issues of the world and uh, with Stanley and Betty's guidance have come to an understanding of the right way uh, to, to go about pursuing peace. Um, I, when I'm given the opportunity to, to speak about Stanley, I always look to other people whose, whose words can somehow hopefully be uh, more uh, piercing in terms of the revelation of what Stanley uh, is and what he means to me. Václav Havel said, for instance, the salvation of this human world lies nowhere else than in the human heart, in the human power to reflect, in human meekness, and in human responsibility. That speaks very clearly to Stanley, his, his heart, his power to reflect, his responsibility, the meekness problem uh, is an issue for me, but, <laughs> but heart responsibility and power to reflect are absolutely clearly, clearly belonging to Stanley. 
Um, and, and Thomas Jefferson, uh, some of you may know, said, in matters of style, swim with the current. We've always known Stanley to be <laughs> creating the current in matters of style. But he said, in matters of principle, stand like a rock. Stanley has stood like a rock. He has stood in this country. He has stood for people who were in need of a champion. He has stood abroad for people in need of a champion. He is a champion. Um, but when I found these words, uh, and these are words that I think are perfectly appropriate in so many ways, in many ways because they were written by a man who was on death row in our country until it was discovered that uh, we shouldn't kill him because he might be innocent. But he remains behind bars today. And he wrote this, he said, our journey, the lanes we tread, unfolds not only within the depths of our souls, but through words and deeds in the world. The course we traverse extends beyond us through the relationships that connect us to others. And long after we're gone, the course we walked may still be discerned in the traces we left in those who knew, or those we knew, and in the things we created and transformed. I think of the life of Stanley Scheinbaum, and I think of the idea that the course he has walked uh, will leave and has left these traces uh, as a result of our knowing him, our having been impacted by the extraordinary work he has done, uh, and the things he has created, and the lives he has transformed. And it therefore gives me great pleasure to be here to speak tonight to the extraordinary dignity and courage and power this man has brought to my life and to the lives of tens of thousands, if not more, other people, simply through the simple humanity that he has demonstrated. Every day, every day, this man is a giant. Thank you, Stanley. Now, the Nuclear Edge Peace Foundation is pleased to present its 2008 World Citizenship Award to Stanley K. Schoenbaum for his sustained and courageous efforts to forge peace and create new dialogue between old adversaries. I am really proud to be the recipient of this award from the Nuclear Edge Peace Foundation. It is of critical importance that its work be carried on and made a major component of what this country and other societies engage in. I want to thank David Krieger. I want to thank the board of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. And I want to thank everybody who's here tonight and I see a lot of familiar faces. I am proud to be back in Santa Barbara, where with the work of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, we feebly attempted to do what the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation is achieving now. And the work of this evening is a major step and I am proud to be here with George Regas sharing this award tonight. And uh, thank you all. The ancient prophet Micah said, what does the Lord require of you? Three things, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's a pretty good explanation of who Reverend Regus is. The fascinating thing about the ancient prophets was that they were able to speak the truth with divine inspiration. And if the people and the leaders heard, they were actually able, they had the power to actually change public opinion 
and entire nations would move in a different direction. And I'll never forget the first time I heard the Reverend George Regas speak. It was shortly after the United States invaded Iraq. And every one of us in this room were very distraught. I know I was. And it was a very discouraging time. And I went to hear Reverend Regas speak. And what he said had such, made such an imprint on my heart that I think I went home and recited that message verbatim to my husband. And I thought at that time, how like the ancient prophets you are. I can't help but think if the President of the United States and the entire Congress had heard Reverend Regas that morning, I'd like to think we would have changed our course. The preeminent Jewish theologian said, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, the opposite of good is not evil, it is indifference. Reverend Regas, you have never been indifferent about the cause of peace and justice. You've been an outstanding voice for peace. You took great risk from your pulpit. With courage and divine insight, you have continuously led the opposition to war and the nuclear arms race. And so it is with great honor, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, that we bestow on you the 2008 World Leadership Award for Peace. It's wonderful to see so many of you here on this night and to be honored along with Stanley means so much to me for Stanley and I have been friends, co-workers, colleagues for almost 30 years. Stanley is a great man, and I love him dearly. I've known David Krieger and the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation throughout your courageous history of 25 years. We have been together, and what important, innovative, challenging work you've done over those critical years, and I'm proud to be part of it. It's really a profound honor to, to follow people like the Dalai Lama and Jody Williams and Desmond Tutu. And then coming after last year's honorees, the incomparable singing trio, Peter, Paul, and Mary, I feel like I should sing Blowing in the Wind or If I Had a Hammer. But Mary Riga said, please spare them. <laughs> the, this award means so much to me. It reaches into the deep places of my spirit and I am so grateful. Uh, Mark, your words touched my heart and I'm grateful for those words and they will uh, empower me for the living of these next years of my life. But they did remind me of a story. <laughs> One day a speaker was introduced like this Listen to this man, for he really is a great man, as is evidenced by the fact that he made a million dollars in California oil. So listen to him. Well, the speaker responded with thanks, but he was a little bit embarrassed because the, some items were there being recited, but they really 
weren't related to the truth. He, he said, I, he was introduced as, as being important because he had made a million dollars in California oil. He said, first, it wasn't California, it was Pennsylvania. Second, it wasn't oil, it was coal. Third, it wasn't a million dollars, it was a hundred thousand. Fourth, it wasn't me, but my brother. <laughs> and fifth, he didn't make it, he lost it. <laughs> but facts aside, I'm glad to be here. Well, I am George Regas, and I'm glad to be here. I don't know much about making a million dollars, but I do know a few things about peacemaking. And they asked me to make an address, and I have carefully prepared something to say to you. And the first point of this speech is about President elect Obama and peacemaking. There is a deep, deep rejoicing with the election of Barack Obama. All, all over the world, Obama's election has sent a message that hope is viable, that change is really possible, and that peace is on its way. So President-elect Obama, hear us. Your first decision as president must be to instruct the Joint Chiefs of Staff to prepare a sensible plan of ending the Iraq war and occupation. Get us, get us out of Iraq. No more arguments about timetables. And if you establish a peace department and allow Rabbi Leonard Bierman and me to, to head it up, and then allow us to bring onto our active board Reverend Ann Howard and Rabbi Stephen Jacobs and Stanley Scharnbaum and Dr. Nazir Kaja and Mike Farrell and Bob Shear and Steve Rohde, then we will have peace in this world. When both when both John McCain and Barack Obama during the presidential campaign would say, we are the greatest country in the world, the city shining on a hill, that America with our history is exceptional. That rhetoric always pushed me away. Not that I don't love America, I love it deeply. But this kind of thinking, this exceptionalism, is central to the Iraq tragedy. At the grave, we are all equal. And the suffering of one is not more important than the suffering of another. And this reality has been tragically missing from the American psyche. I think of all those children killed in Iraq as a result of our war. I think of those 30,000 children who die every day because of hunger and malnutrition and my heart is broken. Very clearly, modern war is total war. With the lethality of modern weapons, there can be no discrimination between combatants and civilians some studies say more than a million civilians, children, have been killed in the Iraq war. And we need to proclaim as loudly as we can that war with the face it wears today is sin itself. Jesus would bless Howard Zinn when he said there is no flag large enough to cover the shame of killing 
innocent people. The sin and evil at the heart of this war, this Bush war in Iraq, is the belief that an American child is of more value than an Iraqi child. That an American baby is more precious than an Iraqi baby. Therefore, a reaffirmation of our common humanity and our equality in joy and in pain must be given primacy if there's ever to be peace on this earth. Barack Obama must restore American moral credibility, closing Guantanamo, banning all torture, and ending the war in Iraq and our occupation. That will provide a start, but only that. He must inspire the world, as he has America, that great things are possible, and that we can have a world without war. My second point, the worldwide economic crises are overwhelming. They are significant moral issues surrounding this bleak situation. Larry Bartles of Princeton University is one of the country's leading political scientists, and he has some provocative things to say in his new book, Unequal Democracy, the Political Economy of the New Gilded Age. He says, from the 1940s to the 1970s, the real income of the poorest fifth of Americans more than doubled, advancing faster than any other quintile. And since 1974, the pattern has been skewered significantly toward the rich. The years 1979 through 2008 have been calamitous for the poor and even the middle class in the United States. Larry Bartles writes that he was surprised to find in his research how profoundly partisan differences affected economic outcomes. It is true there are many causes for the growing inequality in our globalized economy, but it is unwise to assume there is no cause and effect relating relationship between government policies and income distribution. Professor Bartles asserts economic inequality is in substantial part a political phenomenon. The war system is so deeply embedded in this nation in education, in government, in industry. Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate for economics, is saying in a new book, The Three Trillion Dollar War, that the Iraq War will eventually cost the United States three to five trillion dollars. Forty percent of the 1,650,000 people who have been deployed in Iraq are coming home with disabilities, some serious disabilities. And that's an obligation we must honor, and we will be paying for this for decades to come. We have borrowed every dime for the Iraq War. George Bush has tried to pretend that you can have a war and not pay the price. And what a tragedy. The war system is a criminal mismanagement of humanity's resources. <laughs> My 
My third point deals with nuclear weapons. The political reality that nuclear war still remains an option for America, Russia, China, Britain, France, Pakistan, India, and Israel, North Korea. That reality is the paramount moral issue of our time. James Carroll, whom many of us respect and love, his writings, wrote in the Boston Globe, October 13, 2008, a column where he says the word meltdown comes naturally to the lips this last week, referring to the collapse of the financial markets. But Carroll talks about another meltdown, which is the purpose of the nuclear bomb. He says, the economic meltdown caused us to ignore a much greater problem. That very week, over the signature of the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, and the Secretary of Energy, Samuel Bodman, the government released the statement, national security and nuclear weapons in the 21st century. The two officials argue that the time has come for the development of new nuclear weapons, the so-called reliable replacement warheads, RRW, because nuclear weapons remain an essential and enduring element, they say, of American military strategy and the aging arsenal of several thousand deployed nukes and many more stored nukes must be replaced. Obviously, Bush will not succeed in this new nuclear weapons proposal. He will not get it approved in Congress. What Gates and Bodman are doing is urging the nuclear what they're doing at the urging of the nuclear establishment is putting this item at the very top of the next president's agenda. For 20 years, the United States has been ambivalent about the nuclear arsenal. And that indecision was enshrined in the policy that America would lead the post-Cold War, post War world in the ongoing reduction of nuclear weapons, aiming at the ultimate abolition called for by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. However, at the same time, we would maintain a sizable nuclear force, both deployed and stored, as a protection, a hedge, against the reemergence of some Cold War-style threat. This nuclear policy was deadly contradicting. It simply made the U.S. leadership on meaningful nuclear weapons reduction impossible. Today, nuclear nations want to renew and expand their arsenals, keeping their own nuclear advantage and non-nuclear states, especially Iran, are moving towards acquiring, acquiring nuclear weapons. And the Gates-Bodman recent proposal is saying that if the policy of deterrence fails, these are their words, there will be an actual use of nuclear weapons to defeat an enemy. That is incomprehensible. Once nuclear war begins, all nations 
and all notions of victory and defeat are meaningless. Rabbi Bierman, Leo Beck Temple, and I, along with All Saints, for 10 years, 1979 to 1990, we had the Interfaith Center to reverse the nuclear arms race. And I can still hear the words of Dr. Marvin Goldberger, distinguished physicist and former president of Caltech. He spoke at one of our meetings these words. Those who use the rhetoric that suggests we can survive and win a nuclear war are certifiably insane. Such rhetoric is the greatest illusion of our day. It points to the moral bankruptcy of our age. The non-proliferation treaty has integrity only if we are committed to the centerpiece of that treaty, a movement towards nuclear abolition. In the United States, the public has been manipulated to focus almost exclusively on nuclear proliferation. And so there is no attention given to the possession and the continued development of nuclear weapons and the thinly disguised reliance on their threatened use. When we deal with Iran, we are using a nuclear double standard. We only discuss proliferation. The United States must commit to nuclear disarmament if we are to have integrity. <laughs> the real reason Iran should not have nuclear weapons is because no country should have nuclear weapons. And the only way, the only way to prevent Iran and other aspiring countries acquiring those deadly, world-destroying nuclear weapons is for this country and Russia to disarm. To deal with Iran with any integrity, we must move on those two fronts, non-proliferation and equally the disarmament front. We must build an effective system of collective security that doesn't rely in any way on nuclear weapons. I have a fourth point. The time they've given me is almost run out, but not quite. None of this will happen without you and me. If there is to be a progressive agenda, Barack Obama must use his bully pulpit to continue to inspire and educate America to move this country in a new direction. But he needs a grassroots movement for peace. And if Obama is to succeed in great ways as our president, which I think he can, he must have us as peace protagonists at the very center of his administration. Franklin Delano Roosevelt recognized his ability to push legislation through Congress depended on the pressure generated by protesters and organizers. He once told a group of activists who sought his support for their legislation, you've convinced me, now go out and make me do it. There are many factors contributing to Obama's great victory, but the real key to his success was grassroots organizing. And now Obama's supporters will need to transform that electoral energy into grassroots movement for change. Winning the election was only the beginning, the first stage 
of a broader movement to help America become a nation of compassion and justice and peace. Do you remember during the Vietnam War that Newsweek cover in 1971 of that naked nine-year-old Vietnamese girl running down the road screaming, her skin on fire from a napalm bomb? The picture epitomized the horrific tragedy of the Vietnam War. Americans began rather miraculously to identify with that child. She was just like our own children. She too was precious to a mother and father and precious to God. That realization, the sacredness of all life was central to the mobilization and final victory of the peace movement during the Vietnam War. And the same motivating experience of compassion can help us build a peace movement today. Virtually every meaningful social transformation in the history of the United States has resulted as a result from nonviolent movements that have mobilized grassroots people power. Well, I, I closed by saying I hope we remember that there is such a thing as being too late. Will we learn the perils of revenge and violence and war and, and nuclear threats soon enough to act and change our ways? Will we learn before it's too late? Of all of Michelangelo's powerful figures, none is more poignant than the man in the last judgment being dragged down to hell by the demons. A hand over one eye, and in the other eye, a dire sense, a dire recognition. He understood, but all too late. Michelangelo was right. Hell is truth seen too late tonight. We mobilize. Tonight, we mobilize. Thank you very much.